Welcome back to Hello County, where we are learning so much from the Milwaukee Fire Department Chief. And his name is Aaron Lipsky, fourth generation on the force. And uh, we are learning so much. Now, I, I left with the teaser talking about budgets. And while we will touch on that, I have a few other things that I actually want to um, chat since I've got you in the chair. Um, during your time as battalion chief, you're, you're recognized for initiating a series of familiarization exercises with all neighboring fire departments. And at that time, at least, it was fairly common knowledge um, that there was very little interaction and, in fact, possibly some frosty relationships. And how yes. the question behind that is, how did you approach it and succeed at it? So our, our fire chief at the sign had, at the time, uh, had signed an agreement uh, called Mavis Mutual Aid Box Alarm System, uh, basically saying yes, Milwaukee will agree to go outside of our city limits or even outside the county uh, if such a large emergency occurs that you need our resources. Likewise, we will accept into our city outside resources as we request them. Uh, and very new to us, uh, my entire career, uh, we just didn't. If, if Wauwatosa had a fire, <laughs> they handled it, the whole ring of suburban fire departments around the city, excuse me, they would, you know, transect across the entire city to go help, you know, the, the Glendale Fire Department, and we would have, you know, eight times as many fire trucks sitting between the two entities that were helping each other. And, uh, I mean, at, at the time, the, it was simply... Well, this was... This was really some old guy stuff, is what this was. That's, and I, and I have no better way to explain it than uh, we learned to distrust and not like them from our, you know, forefathers, just the same way they learned to dislike us and not trust us. And it really, like at a certain point, it was so ridiculous. To, to believe, based on no actual information, that the folks arriving on a Wauwatosa fire engine, literally two blocks west of here, were somehow, they just empirically would, like their water didn't work as good to put fire out as ours would. That was ridiculous. And it was so ridiculous that uh, right after this Mabus agreement was signed, I was a battalion chief way on the northwest corner of, of the city, which is also the northwest corner of the county. Uh, and we butted up against, I want to say, seven or eight different municipalities. And I had zero understanding based on the Iron Curtain mentality we'd all had. I had zero understanding of what did, a, what did their operation look like. Um, and thankfully, we had a new fire chief at the time, Chief Mark Rolfing, who was a fairly progressive guy for the fire service, at least around what here. What year was this approximately? 2009, 2010. That recent? Yeah. Okay. And, it, and I mean, this went on for a long time prior to that. Uh, and I said, I, I asked him, I said, I want to I wanna pull these folks together just, just to introduce and say hello. And... So we had it way, way out on, on Granville and Donna, uh, way out you know, west of Northridge even, uh, Engine 38. And we invited specific people from all these departments. And I had no idea what response I was going to get. I thought they might just tell me to go fly a kite. Uh, but they all responded right away. And what I discovered afterwards is I had my equal in all of these fire departments where we were all kind of scratching our head going, why? Oh, because, you know, some old timer, you know, wrinkled his nose up one day about it. So that's where I learned. And so we, for the first time, at least in our generation, uh, we had 
a Milwaukee fire engine attached to a hydrant pumping to a, I want to say maybe it was a Butler fire engine flowing water out of a Menominee Falls ladder truck, which that may sound, whoa, like we almost cured cancer by doing that. <laughs> Uh, but it was monumental, yeah. and the number of times that picture was shared, if someone was up on the roof and kind of got the whole layout, mm -hmm. the number of times that picture was shared, uh, it was, and we really should have been embarrassed for ourselves that it took this long, but thank goodness it came along because fast forward, uh, we now share seamlessly across borders. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, if there's a life critical incident, it has nothing to do with, well, that's our fire, and so you're not allowed to come, or we won't withhold resources. Uh, and this is a perfect area to talk about here. We're uh, right at 59th and North Avenue here, so you go a block west, and you start to cut into a part of Tosa. Uh, so if Tosa would have a house fire, they're not looking to just uh, front load it all with just their own resources. Because that doesn't best serve the end user. What they are looking for are the closest, most appropriate resources. Mm -hmm. And so if one of our stations or two of our stations happen to be closer, we will co-join their response right now. Mm. And everybody knows how to work around each other. It is not perfect, because don't forget the whole we're all a family thing. Mm -hmm. um, now we're all different families with all of our own. Ooh, we're a blended family now. We're a blended family, and so that's an excellent, that's the first time I ever thought about it that it. way. I'm gonna take that one now. But we're like crashing together, and we've done a ton of training with each other, and we've got all of our SOGs uh, aligned now. So we, we know what to expect from them, they know what to expect from us. And what is an SOG? Um, a standard operating guideline. Thank you. So it's, it's, it's what guides us uh, in the absence of a direct order, essentially. Uh, and it, that's important because our fire engines and our ladder trucks, uh, they're expected to go to work without a chief sit being there to point them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, we want them to make those evaluations of what they're seeing because time is of the essence. But we've got those things formalized now. We came through a huge moment. Uh, we were looking to revamp our whole standard operating guideline mm -hmm. for fighting high-rise fires. And we have more high rises than anybody else in the county, uh, so we needed. And that's its own animal. Uh, it is. I lived in Midtown Manhattan. You all right? It's it's an entirely different. It's a thing. different animal. And uh, so, we partnered with all of our shared services partners, and uh, at the time it did not include every suburban fire department, but many of them. Uh, but we got every fire department in the county to participate in this, and just ripped our high-rise firefighting protocol, just kind of didn't crumple it up and throw it away, but set it aside for a little while and ton mm -hmm. of research. Bunch of us went to a high-rise firefighting conference in Florida, uh, came back with just a wealth of information. We started parsing through it. And this, this is, mm -hmm. it was almost more important than the, the end product. Right. Was right. going through the process together uh, because a lot of debate and argumentation and questioning and re-questioning. It was like the biggest peer review process I've ever been through in the fire service because like we talked about before, we'll tell you if we think it's wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and then at a certain point, you have, to, you have to move the right foot in front of the left foot, the left foot, you know, you have to move forward. And we got through that and we then took that SOG and did a command level training for every chief officer in the county and an operations live action uh, training for every firefighter in the county. That was at the time, I think, 15 or 1600 firefighters. Mm -hmm. And we all have different shift schedules. And everybody has, they all have different staffing capabilities to release people to go play firefighter at a high rise building for four hours. But it How was- How cool is that? It, it was awesome. It was, it was great and so, our good friends in Wauwatosa uh, obtained uh, access to a big building on the southwest corner of the Mayfair property that was going to be gutted out and is now a hotel. Ooh. But before it got gutted out, they let us, we were in there for probably a month and a half, and we would 
I mean, they went through actual, without fire, we couldn't burn their property. But, you know, we had, we had <laughs> theater smoke in there and, and it, just the, the distances and the scope oh, yeah. of these buildings is daunting. And, and disorienting. Information and... flow and communications and wayfinding and, and communicating to someone else where you are and where the issue is. And you've been crawling for 200 meters making a bunch of turns. That's very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, that What's the device that is worn now that is kind of like a GPS? So that it keeps the, it lets people so, know a, a, a firefighter's position? So uh, that device is not yet perfected. So there's a number of attempts. However, uh, we have partnered with uh, a firm, uh, and I'm gonna withhold saying the name right now, but we have partnered with a firm and we're fairly early in this who has demonstrated to me, the biggest critic, <laughs> uh, they're the closest. And so we're going to be grabbing a bunch of these. We're going to be testing them at our academy, and we are going to field implement some of these. Uh, it is it is stunning how far this has come in a pretty short period of time because a lot of people have tried, and there are weird scientific reasons that it's difficult to do. Uh, everybody thinks, well, just use GPS. It doesn't quite work that way when you well, have in certain three, buildings, three dimensions. You need and, a signal. You need right. So. Uh, yeah, it's it's part GPS, part other Something super else. secret technology. Ooh, love I had it. a question. How do you? What's kind of the like? How much planning goes into how they approach a particular fire? Like in the moment versus sort of pre-planned in some of these scenarios scenarios you kind of discussed like how much improvisation i guess maybe is there so it's it's a it's probably one of the most fascinating parts of the fire service to me is that exact dynamic between an sog which says if you pull up and you have a fire on this floor of this type of building this is what we anticipate you should do mm -hmm. so and what that is is that's a a pattern set based upon best practices that have just developed organically over time and or have been studied and proven and then implemented, it's that pattern set versus what are you actually looking at mm. right now? What are you seeing right now? Because we don't want, we can't have robots running around. Um, we have to have our lieutenants and captains, our HEOs and our firefighters have to have the ability to constantly observe and take in new information or different information and do that calculus in very short order to say, I know it says I'm supposed to go here, but that, that thing is in the way and will kill me, so I can't. I have to find a different way. Mm -hmm. And importantly then, they have to be given the freedom to call that audible and then communicate it to everybody. Mm -hmm. And it's on the very first page of our SOGs in the forward. Mm -hmm. uh, we explicitly state uh, these are guidelines. And right. you, you are not only allowed to, you're expected to deviate if it's gonna cause more harm to follow the SOG. Right. But you must communicate it to everybody so everybody knows that the Keeping you know, everyone the, on the it's same like the page. quarterback has to call that or nobody knows what the play is, right? right. Um, and, you know, I, 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 I've used this example a lot and it's probably kind of tired, but if I'm a battalion chief out in front of a burning house and I say, hey, engine 32, I want you to take the second hose line and go to the second floor and put that fire out in the front of the building. And they deploy the hose and they crawl around and they get up there. Uh, and they can't get to the front of the building because the floor has burned through. The order was to go to the front of the building and put the fire out. But their knowledge and their lived experience in that moment is more than I can know from standing outside of the building. Mm -hmm. So I need for them to be comfortable enough to go, hey, chief, 
uh, that's a non-starter. We got we got holes burned through wall to wall here. We can't. We, there's no way to get across. Right. So, a good fire chief then has to take that information and change the plan. Mm -hmm. Not on the fly. On the fly, not browbeat people for being able not being able to achieve impossible things. Right. You got to change the plan. Right. And when that starts working, and it, that requires trust in both directions, sure. which is a hard thing. Uh, but once you have some level of trust that, listen, you're a first day on the job as a lieutenant crawling up here, and now you're telling a battalion chief no, but, but also why. It's a hard thing to train into people that... But it's so critical. I want, and I, I tell people that I promote to battalion deputy or assistant chief, I am not hiring you to agree with me. I'm hiring you to parse through information and, and compare those past patterns to what our environment is right now and where is there a gap. Let's always be trying to fill those gaps. Mm -hmm. So if that means you gotta argue with me and tell me my great idea, my big ivory tower sitting in a cushy office idea is unworkable, I expect you to do that, but bring information. Right. Bring information. Right. I don't want to, I don't feel like it is not information. Correct. Correct. Right? Can you, can you think of instances in your career where, like, the, the science of firefighting has had to catch up to, like, the, I don't know, uh, more, like, tacit knowledge that, that firefighters have? Like, in the sense, like, you sometimes you have these people from afar that are like scientifically like this this should be happening but the procedures that firefighters have developed are kind of i don't know they they operate differently than the than the scientists maybe say they should but that's for good reason that you know they don't understand quite yet or something sorry it's a com confusing question no but no no i i that, think i've got a yeah. good example for it so if you look at how modern building construction is compared to legacy construction. So you drive into these neighborhoods right around here, you have old growth, hard lumber, long, big timbers in many cases that in, in our vernacular, we know that these things can burn for about 45 minutes before they are very, very dangerously okay. close to collapse. And that helps us because you can sort of reverse it's a bit of a window it's, it gives you a little time to get in and make the rescue and put the fire out and save the building um and i don't say that's not a hard and fast rule that's a, a very thumbnail sketch uh view of it uh one major difference between how these buildings are built is uh when you go up on the peaked roof of a legacy an old built home in the city of milwaukee you have big, thick rafters, mm -hmm. 16 inches on center, and you've got big tongue and groove roof board, and you've probably got three or four layers of shingles on there. You have a lot of things holding that roof together. So we can go up on that with a, a decent measure of calculation to ensure for the safety, and we can cut a hole in that roof, peel that back, and let the superheated <coughs> gases and smoke and fire vent out the top so the firefighters can push in and put that fire out. We have special ladders we use called roof ladders, which are just a straight ladder, but it has hooks on the end. And you'll see firefighters feed that ladder up and hook those hooks over the peak. So those hooks grab on, firefighters climb up, do our work, pull the hole, superhero time, pose for pictures after, right? Very important part of things nowadays. Um, go on a modern constructed peaked roof there is no ridge board that runs along that peak so there used to be one big solid beam that would run and all the rafters tie into that that does not exist in modern construction with truss it, truss doesn't need it but that creates a problem when you push a roof ladder up and now you've got hooks set into nothing other than tar paper and some shingles. There's no ridge board for it to really grab onto. So we have to figure something else out. I think I'm, ask, I'm asking the, the inverse. Okay. I'm answering the inverse yeah. of your question. Um, but we've had to 
stop that because, yep, putting that ladder up, that's what we always do. But now we've had to learn how to read from the outside in short order what is new constructed versus mm. legacy <coughs> that just has new siding on it, right? Yeah. And there's differences and you learn to spot those very quickly. Mm. Um, the, the, on the issue of trusses, uh, these are wonderful for building construction. They're wonderful for keeping the costs of building down both on the material end and on a, the labor end. Mm -hmm. But yet again, the fire service has had to catch up and these things have, you know, a two minute burn time before you, you have an entire section of truss collapse. They're not 16 inches on center. So you have a much bigger collapse space. Um, I'm getting science nerdy a little bit about this here, but uh, th this is a real problem. This is a real problem for us. Uh, and buildings are, the whole building construction industry is being driven like mules mm -hmm. to make everything more efficient. Well, there is a, a crossover point where efficiency turns into brittle and fragile. And that crossover exists for firefighters when something unplanned happens to the building, i.e. a fire. Mm -hmm. And if you're not properly planning for that occurrence, you're not building a home that is expected to have the greatest risk on the planet, mm -hmm. humans inhabit the home. And you'll find uh, it's just not really thought about in the right context many times. So things unplanned for. I mean, that's, it's what you do. 9-11 was kind of an extreme, uh, particularly with high rise and, and so on and so forth of not planned for. How did n the events of 9-11 shape the Milwaukee Fire Department, if at all? Well, Probably in some ways that would surprise you. Uh, we we were brutally impacted just from a. I drove down to a fire station where my brother was working. I was off duty; he was on duty, and my dad was working as the deputy chief. We all convened at this one fire station, and we just stood and watched on TV. It was. I had zero experience with that amount of fire that high up in a building in my life, uh, as, as I think most, most firefighters in the nation would agree. So we felt very helpless because, you know, we, we all fashion ourselves to be like, yeah, we'll go figure it out. I had no idea where, where that would even start. And we were having very tactical conversations watching on the television like, you know, now once we understood these these were deliberate plane attacks, we we were wondering how the in-building systems would even be functioning. Uh, the the pipes we used to send water up to the top, we assumed some of those would be sheared off from all the impact. That makes it kind of hard to contain the water. Um, but an interesting thing happened post 9/11, and I know I'm not unique in observing this and Milwaukee's not unique in this regard. Uh, much like a lot of people wanted to go be Navy SEALs uh, after seeing American Sniper or Black Hawk Down or any other number of movies or all the movies about uh, going in and getting Bin Laden, uh, not everybody's really cut out to be Navy SEALs to go on big counter-terrorist missions. And an interesting thing happened is everybody wanted to be a firefighter and paramedic all of a sudden, and not everybody was really cut out for it. And a huge problem began to occur where there was sort of this entitlement that got built into the fire service, riding on the coattails of the hundreds of firefighters murdered in 9-11, where it was like, well, I'm a firefighter here, and, and it felt nice. I'm not, I, I can't, it felt very nice, the, the outpouring of support, 
that I got from friends, from neighbors, from people I didn't even know. There was so much food brought to fire stations, you know, which didn't help with the physical fitness end of things. But um, that, that outpouring was very nice, but it almost, I noticed in some folks it became sort of the expectation. And that's the exact opposite of what we are here for. Um, and so what we needed to do was we needed to get back to the basics of what are we doing here. Uh, we serve to exist people on their worst days. Alarm goes off, you go out the door. Uh, we, are not, we are not superhuman. We are not, uh, you know, uh, the Avengers. We are not, we are none of these things. We are people who have chosen to step up and put ourselves in very, very uncomfortable, horrible situations just so we might be able to make it even a little bit better. And we're really, I, I really feel like we're getting back to that spot right now. Uh, and, you know, I, I always have like a Norman Rockwell image in my head of the firehouse door up and some firefighter out there probably with some like ridiculous mustache. Like, <laughs> I always make fun of the firefighters with mustaches. I don't know why, it's, it's November, so everybody's trying to grow their, right? Um, but I've never, I've never been able to pull it off. It's super patchy. It's more information than you want it, but, um, Sounds a little envious if you ask me, but that's it, okay. It, hey, hey, envy is a powerful tool. Uh, but, uh, you know, washing the rig and, you know, the Dalmatian, which is like a ridiculous mythology, right? Um, but I have this image in my head of, there's always kids around in that picture. There's always someone walking by. In the Norman Rockwell setting, yes. Right? Yes. And I recall earlier in my career, that was just how it was. The doors were up. You want your bicycle fixed and you're a seven-year-old and the tire went flat? We had, we honestly, guys would pool money and we had like a little bike repair shop in the back of the fire station because you just knew what was going to happen. And that right there it speaks to the very essence and the reason that a fire department exists. It is, a, it is an institution in a neighborhood that everybody, everybody knows. You go up and you ring that doorbell, there is help, or at least we'll get you to help on the other side of that door. And so the six-year-old squeaking in on the bike with the chain that fell off and the flat tire, that's easy for us but so difficult for that kid, and that's the essence of it. It's not whether the emergency rises to the level of our mock bravado. It is you help because you can. That's it. That's the equation. Does that explain in part the number of functioning volunteer departments? It. I was coming from Wisconsin, born and raised, moving to the Eastern Seaboard, and I was out there during 9-11, mm. but um, blew my mind away. Outside of New York City, yes. almost all volunteer. Yes, the, the East Coast is very, very, very still strong with, with huge departments that are all or, or, or at least partially composed of volunteer forces. Um, and plenty in Wisconsin, too. Oh, Once, yep, I'm not you know, selling I was short. made aware of it out there, but when I came back here, so it's like, how? Especially with the advancements, especially yes. with how, how, does, how do volunteer fire houses still so, exist? Uh, well, because the human spirit allows it to exist. That's the, the simple answer. Um, the not so great news is the volunteer fire force as an entity is struggling across the nation and Wisconsin is just the same and it's struggling not because there's not volunteers there are certainly people who still go out and get the training on their own and and show up and now hey I want to be a volunteer on my community's you know fire company 
and that is, that's excellent, but people do need to have a living wage, which, what am I talking about? Well, what I'm talking about is because run totals are on the rise everywhere, EMS and fire runs, there are way more times people are getting called out and have to leave their job to go zip on over to the fire station and take the ambulance to the call or drive the fire engine to the, the call. And employers have been the biggest support system for the volunteer fire service of anybody because they have had to say, yep, I'll take it in the bottom line just a little bit or I'll slow down productivity just a little bit because you have to leave for an hour and a half. That was acceptable once every couple days. But nobody's going to pay an employee to work at the widget shop to be gone for eight and a half hours a day, which is the whole work day. And, and that's... You okay? Mm -hmm. That's the reality of it. Um, and so now you've started to see this shift, and this is much longer probably than 15, 20 years old, of a shift to paid on call or paid per call or combination fire departments that maintain a full-time staff but then are augmented by volunteers to, to adjust for that problem. But all of this costs money. Mm -hmm. And we are arguably an expensive service. And there's no sense sugarcoating it. We're a very expensive service. But it is expensive to fund a proper fire department. And so society needs to decide, you want us to keep coming and solving all the problems, that's great, we will do it. And we'll keep figuring out how to solve all the new problems we're dreaming up. But you can't have your cake and eat it too. And I have, I've, I, I had drummed into me a respect, a healthy respect by my grandfather and my father for what volunteer fire departments are up against because uh, they're, they're arriving comparatively uh, with lesser people. Older equipment old, often. Older equipment and, and from further distances. Mm -hmm. But the problem is the same. Mm -hmm. They have to do the same work. Mm -hmm. I can throw, you know, 30 people at a house fire three blocks from here. Inside of 10, 12 minutes, I can have that entire structure fire response there. Uh, that's... That's decent. That's not anywhere as good as it used to be, but that's, that's a decent response compared to you may have six people and it takes you 25 minutes to assemble them. All the same work has to get done. So huge, profound respect for the volunteer fire, fire service. I had, a I had a question related to that um, about kind of like the the future of firefighting or the, the future of the fire department, just in the sense that, and maybe you can correct me if, I, if I'm wrong, but it seems like they're answering a lot more non-fire related calls than maybe they had in the past. And I don't know what the cause of that, and maybe you can talk about that too. But like, is there, I don't know, is there, are people trying to like re-envision what, what fire departments do? Is there, is there talk of having other organizations kind of support some of these non-fire related things? I, I'm not sure how the, they think about it. So uh, for a long time, and, and we, we took over emergency medical services in the city, uh, I want to say around s maybe 79 or 80, 1981 maybe, uh, and uh, we professionalized emergency medical services in the city, meaning we actually got EMT licenses and properly constructed and outfitted ambulances. And we began going and doing that work. And when this first started, you called 911 only if you thought, I'm dying right now or my leg just got cut off. This is really bad. See, before there were ambulances, people dealt with it differently. Mm -hmm. You carried your buddy to the car and you drove them to an emergency room and that in and of itself probably worked for many things uh, but once we began arriving because let's face it 
if you haven't looked at kind of the visual monstrosity of some of these emergencies, if you haven't looked at it a lot, when you're faced with it, people go into like auditory and visual exclusion and they like they, they blank out mm -hmm. or they go hysterical crazy, which doesn't help. So all of a sudden people started realizing, oh wait, I can just dial this number and these folks just show up. Oh, and they'll take me right there? Oh, and I can bypass the waiting room? And so it's a self-fulfilling prophecy that fire-based EMS, well, that all EMS has created, that people rely upon us and therefore the demand goes up. Uh, Build it and they will come. Well, and they have, they have come. They have come in, in a big way. And so the number, it, it's different depending on who you ask. Um, but it, it's always brought up that, well, most of what you do is emergency medical service work. And that's always said in sort of a, so you're not really a fire department anymore. And I'm not entertaining that line of thought. Because you, <laughs> even if 1% of our calls are fires, I still need somebody to go handle that. See, because if someone out on the sidewalk out here kills over and has a heart attack, I can get your crews here, we can help. If we're late to that, because we're tied up at different emergencies and we're coming from a further distance, that's horrible, that's unfortunate. But that single person having a heart attack doesn't grow and expand and involve other things. If you leave the fire unchecked, it most definitely does. And when we have entire neighborhoods of homes built this close together with mm. combustible wood siding, I, if someone wants to sign off on that plan of, well, it's okay, just yeah, that's just how it is. We'll burn seven houses down then. But I'm, I wasn't, I wasn't uh, sworn in with an oath that said, only do it some of the time. We do it all of the time. Um, so to that end, we've watched our numbers and you know, I think we got around 75 or 80% of our workload was EMS and it was kind of creeping up that way for a while. Well, now as all the runs are going up, we are finding that the fire runs are climbing faster than the EMS runs. So that has gapped out now to, I want to say we're 71% of our workload is EMS and the remainder is fire type runs. And with the explosion in our total run totals, that represents a decent amount of fire activity question about that, um, especially like the major blazes, you know, uh, um, how paramilitary is the Milwaukee Fire Department or any sure. professional fire department for that matter? Um, because I was living out east during 9-11 and my understanding is rigs were being sent from vast distances. Um, and it, it's because of the paramilitary nature. Could you speak to that a little bit? So uh, I would imagine they were getting rigs from vast distances early on because um, they requested a fifth alarm assignment very early in that. And well, just the fact that you have yeah, the there's there's no way two, to two fill alarm. That. I survived a two alarm fire. Okay, just for giggles. Um, and 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 by the way. Um, my understanding, and I am mentioning it, mentioning it because as we're heading into one of your peak seasons, Christmas time, right? Yeah, we it gets we get busy there. People especially just love with burning a, their house down. Especially at with a cold snap and live and Christmas candles trees candles and, and eggnog and whatnot. Um, is that for for myself? Yes, there was it was a blaze. Yes, two departments got called out. That's part of my understanding of, you know, a two alarm. It's more than one. Yeah, it's a whole bunch of department trucks, um and uh and that uh, for me sadly the the alarm went off every month and it was truly the little boy that cried wolf sure. so 
several of us did have to be pulled off the second story because we you know, waited to the last moment. For me, because I know someone who knows things, I knew enough to not try and go into the hallway with the undulating inky black smoke that was, and I think a lot of people don't realize that. So we're gonna, I'm gonna turn it back to you as far as the, the, the nature of, you know, you said New York put out a five alarm and, and again, the paramilitary nature and just wrap it up with what people should know <laughs> heading into. All right, so fire we, season. We, uh, we refer to our system as quasi-military. Uh, and what that suggests is that uh, when we go operational, when we go kinetic, right, the alarm goes off, we function uh, under a uh, very rigid, strict chain of command. Uh, information goes up, commands go down, scalar is the model, that's the big pyramid with the boss on top. Um, and then when we're non-operational, when we're in between runs, things can be more, you know, dial it back a little bit. There's still a chain of command. There are still, you know, directives, in some cases, orders that have to be given and followed. Uh, but it, it, you, that, that's where you can have more of your relationship building and your, well, but why do you want me to do that? Like, you can have more conversation. In the thick of things with time sensitivity being what it is, uh, that's where uh, you're going to see more of the direct order command giving, uh, just out of necessity. So an interesting thing on why people may uh, grow numb to, uh, to the point of ignoring smoke alarms or, or other notification systems, uh, we train every second and every fifth grader, uh, so they get this training twice at a young age every MPS student uh, at our survival live house. And we teach them how to respond to and react to a smoke alarm and where to go and where not to go and what's the safest thing and what, what you want to avoid. And the number of times I have pulled up at burning buildings and the family is outside by the mailbox where they all agreed to meet. And when you talk to them later, they're they're explaining how the second grader came home and showed them what to do. I can tell you the number of times I have gone to schools to observe fire drills, which is something we're required to do. The number of times I have found children who have just self-selected to stay behind is zero. The number of times I have found adults who have just decided I'm busy, it's my lunch hour, I have other work I gotta get done, so I'm just gonna close my door and hope, uh, is high. And let's face it, I have a job because people don't listen to our best recommendations, or anybody's recommendations, especially nowadays. Everybody knows everything about everything because <laughs> they can Google it and now they're an expert. Um, what I would ask for people to believe me when I say it, you have no comprehension of how fast the smoke and fire will spread, nor are you equipped or capable to go in with a bucket of water, you know, against a fire that's anything bigger than a small wastebasket on fire. Call, get out. That's, that's what we need people to know. Um, we go, we go neighborhood to neighborhood and uh, with our, our focus program, firefighters out creating urban safety, and we install smoke alarms and we talk through best practices with people you know, that are kind enough to let us in. Uh, but people should know also, you don't have to wait for us to just canvas and you know, have you accidentally be at home at that same time. Uh, you can call the Milwaukee Fire Department 24 hours a day. All right, and that's number is uh, 286-8980, 286-8980. And that's our smoke alarm hotline. And it's bilingual, it'll ask you a series of questions, you leave it on a recording, and wherever you live, the nearest fire company will make contact with you and we'll come out and we'll test your existing smoke alarms or replace them and put up a new smoke alarm. And 
for free, incidentally. This goes beyond full service as far as I was, uh, as far as I'm concerned. But it's important. It's important. I'm telling you the smoke alarms have, uh, have done wonders. They, they really do. Uh, and we're very, very close uh, working with the uh, Professional Firefighters of Wisconsin Foundation uh, who saw it and is receiving a grant. We're going to uh, siphon off. That's a bad word. <laughs> we're going to split out some of that fund and we're going to buy specifically. Allocate. Allocate. Uh, specifically smoke alarms for deaf and hard of hearing people which are very different uh, and we're gonna get several hundred of these to start uh, and we're gonna work with um, the city's ADA office as well as um, uh, I've got a good friend at Independence First who's gonna uh, help me get the word out on this because everybody has a right to be notified that they're in danger and so we have to find different ways to do that Speaking of in danger and allocating health services, etc., I'm not sure how to parlay this question. A lot of times, you know, you mentioned the hero. Well, I mean, the, the misnomer when people first go out and it's like want yeah. to join and you know the cape and it's like at, at the end of the day, you are in individuals highly trained and yes wanting to help how do you help yourselves with regard to mental health oh yep now yeah. my understanding is after like large events there are like debriefing sessions but obviously people need help all day every day and so how how is the milwaukee fire department 2023 almost 2024 addressing the mental health of their members? Um, I will say we're doing better at it now than we ever have, but we're nowhere near where we need to be. All right. Uh, part of the firefighter ethos or mindset is, uh, there is there is nobody beyond us you can call. So we're kind of the top of the food chain of when everything's going to heck in a handbasket. That's us. When so I that, mentioned the superhero that's right. fac factor, because that when it's all said and it. done, you know, it, it, it seems like part of the issue is people not actually seeking help that's, because there's this. That's correct. Okay. That, that, yep, spot on. Back to you. Spot on. Uh, so you can develop, and it's, it's a real thing, you can develop kind of a sense of that you got this kind of not quite immortality but that hey you've made it through so many scrapes and you've seen it all that you know nah it doesn't bother me and uh so that that can that can feed that and and i and i'm not even suggesting that constant exposure and experience in these these realms causing that is somehow a a bad horrible negative means the person's a bad person it's just reality. You have to grow a skin to this stuff or you wouldn't be able to function. Um, you have to be clinical, you have, you know, but still be decent. Uh, but one of our problems that feeds into this also is the sheer pace of the work. So we've got very nearby engine and ladder companies and paramedic units to this location who repeatedly in a 24 hour shift are going to violent crime scenes horribly wretched car accidents where they have to cut people out, fires, uh, on top of all the regular medical stuff or accidental trauma that can occur to a person. Uh, but they're constantly dealing in that. And they get done with this horrible scene, package up all their bloody gloves, tie it up in a little bag, uh, and the radio is blaring again. Hey, engine 32, we need you to take in uh, a report of a garage on fire and you just shift gears put on a different type of equipment and boom away you go and so the last horrible scene you were at feels like a distant memory in about mm -hmm. 12 seconds mm -hmm. but your brain and your psyche and and wherever you store all that stuff doesn't forget it mm -hmm. so what are we doing right now uh, we have an incredible peer support program 
Uh, and that's important because one thing that's true about firefighters is we know everything, just ask us, right? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. I knew that. Right? I knew that. Yeah. And I say that tongue in cheek, but it is, you know, just the constant getting through it and success and I'm fine feeds that forward uh, where you can really begin to believe like, nah, I'm good, I'm good. At first when they started doing critical incident stress debriefings way, way back, they were bringing in, you know, some fresh faced psychologist who just got his or her degree mm -hmm. uh, with zero exposure or experience in emergency services to come sit at a table with men who were still covered in soot who had just been at a fire where six kids died. I could see where I might not and, be prone to listening to. It, well, it, it, from, I was not there. I wasn't on the job during those times. Mm -hmm. But from my understanding, it got quite verbal uh, because firefighters also understand what they have seen and they know darn well other people haven't seen that. So how dare you come in here and sit at our table and start lecturing us about don't worry about it. And so these people got run out of the firehouses, mm -hmm. figuratively Pretty and, short and order. literally. Yeah. yeah, that this recipe isn't working. But we will talk with other firefighters unprompted in the morning when you come in, hey, how was your night? Oh, we had a, you know, had a, a bad fire. We had, you know, a couple of kids died. They'll talk about every bit of information their brain remembers in the telling of like, this is what we did and this is then ladder truck went through the window to try to get them and we did this, you know, like they'll talk through this whole thing and that, mm -hmm. that's an important, important process uh, because you're helping someone organize that, that uh, memory. Mm -hmm. Uh, but that's not enough. Uh, that's good. Right. And that's some of the most important early, like, Sounds like a start. That a person is talking. That's important. Yeah. Uh, but we follow up then with peer support team members who have additional training uh, in how to deal with somebody who you can understand going in, because I just described it to you. If I show up after I know you've been on just a horrible murder scene with a kid or something, and all of a sudden I show up, Someone already thinks like, oh, the shrink is here, right? And like that's, there's a callousness to that. More apt to shut down. Well, so our peer support team members have training in how to just, how to just be there. And hey, I know that this is some pretty uh, rough stuff. And at least the person saying it to the other firefighter actually knows what that looks and feels and sounds and smells like they've because they've done it and i'm glad you mentioned smell it's Olfactory real factory is one of the it, strongest that's right connections to memory a hundred percent correct a hundred percent correct if you've never smelled burned hair you have no idea mm -hmm. and we've all smelled burned hair and it is a super different smell mm -hmm. so our peer support team is is a collection of folks who have decided to do a little bit more to help out their, their fellow crew members. And we've had some very real success stories uh, where these grizzled, salty veteran firefighters who are like, I don't need all that, kind of hit a wall one day and have reached out, which is a, a super courageous step to take coming from that history. Yeah and have found themselves uh, to be in need and have, have we've facilitated that through our peer support team and through the city's uh, employee assistance program and through other programs that are available. And they've come back changed human beings. Same, same old lovable character, but the weight is off just a little bit. So we've got that. Um, and even before they retire. That's correct. That's correct. On the job. That's right. Uh, you know, the idea is to deliver someone to the end of their career, uh, you know, not sliding in on three wheels with the brakes smoking and the glass busted out, 
the idea is to let them go now and enjoy the rest of their life, have a, have a high quality of life, uh, instead of what we've seen for years, which is, and, and we're starting to pay the, the bills right now for firefighters way overextending. We're having cancer just galloping through our retirees, uh, staggeringly higher rates than, than the average uh, citizen. That's, uh, so we gotta look at all of the aspects. We've, we've always been very physically fitness oriented. Uh, we're now learning about things like resiliency mm -hmm. and compassion fatigue, physical fatigue, sleep hygiene, um, ergonomics, like all these, it sounds very heady and brainy, but if we get some of those things right, we can make it so that they can go on the next run, mm -hmm. but they put themselves through a quick process. We did a test on our firefighters of some of our busiest companies mm -hmm. uh, with, with a very respected, uh, I don't even know if he's, I think he's a doctor, a sports kinesiologist doctor or something. And we wore these halter monitors. I didn't, a bunch of the firefighters did. Uh, and monitored their heart rate 24 hours a day for their shift. And we found out, never would have known this, but even if we didn't have a rough night at the firehouse, I never slept good. Because you don't want to miss the alarm and you're just always like sort of on edge. And then there's always some partner in the dorm snoring, you know, it's like, oh, it was never me though, I never snored. <laughs> don't ask my wife. But uh, what we found is when the alarm would go off, you would have an increase in the heart rate. For certain types of alarms, it would be a much greater increase. And it depended when certain bits of information made mm -hmm. it to the mm -hmm. ears of the firefighters. <clears throat> Boom. Okay, it's, it's go time, we gotta get ready. Um, and then they would come back from the alarm and it would drop down, but it would still be at a level that would suggest Mm -hmm. They were strenuously outputting. Mm -hmm. And they're laying in bed with a resting heart rate of, you know, 140 or 150 right. just laying there. But probably reliving. Well, reliving and, and their, their biologic reaction to the stimulus, we never, we never dealt with the other end of it. Right. And so he suggested, again, these are some grizzled, battle-hardened veterans, he talked them through some breathing exercises, like box breathing and all these things. And so then we had the control group, which was, this ain't right. Like, this is not good for the human heart to be laying here, boom, 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 boom. So do the breathing exercises and you could watch everything recover down to a normal level and people fell asleep. And you could see it, you could see mm -hmm. it on the records from these tests. And we had some folks who were naysayers to beat the band who are some of the biggest sales pitchers for this right now. Um, and so we're, we're constantly looking at these things. What can we do to help? Well, and what I'm hearing too is the fact that people like yourself and, and other core group that have, you know, either volunteered or strongly suggested to join this study and that and, and, and get this data down is that it's making it acceptable. It is more acceptable. More acceptable. I, I will tell you that a few months ago, uh, one of our members uh, died by suicide. Uh, and the survivor's guilt that goes with that is tremendous. Uh, and the people closest to that member carry that. And I learned, and I, because I, I don't, I certainly don't know everything at all. Uh, but I learned that to tell somebody in that moment, oh, you shouldn't, you shouldn't feel bad about it, you shouldn't worry about it. Well, it feels, it feels logical and in, like an intuitive, nice thing to say. What you're basically saying to the person who's broken through this crust and told you that they're carrying this, what you've basically told them is, yeah, 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 I know that's what you said you're feeling, but I'm just gonna negate that because it's a nice thing to say. Mm -hmm. I never, never would have occurred to me. It's the road to Hades with good intentions. Yeah, of course, of course. And so I, 
I learned that over this last time because uh, I have we have some very very exceptional people who have continued to learn and grow and progress in this area and uh, but I will tell you uh, some of the most battle-tested field credible you know fire breathing members of our department were punched in the gut by this one and they began asking and they began so seeking. almost a wake-up call of sort? Yes, and it's, there's no, there is no silver lining to somebody dying by suicide, but one potentially positive outcome is that people finally went like, oh, what is this, what's this sensation I'm having? Mm -hmm. This almost feels unpleasant. What is, what, maybe I should poke at that a little bit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they began to acknowledge like, you know, sorrow and guilt and fear and anger. That's, that's normal right mm -hmm. now. And so don't, don't count yourself out because of it. Right. Almost embrace it. Let's, let's talk. I, I refer to, and I think we'll kind of wrap on this general note, which is focusing on taking care of yourself, the whole. Yes. The whole self, you know, physically fit, great, um, emotional, mental, all of it. I, um, I'm a strong advocate of self-care, and some people might want to say, oh, you're selfish. And it's like, yeah, I am. You're no good to anybody else if you're not taking care and of yourself. And I call that the airplane wisdom. We all have been on that plane, and when, when you're advised that should there be a disruption in cabin pressure and it, and it drops down, yep. What are you, what's everyone, everyone instructed to do? Secure your own mask first. Before you help. Yep. Because you are of no use to anyone else. And with that, I do want to mention again that Don Haas, who's been enjoying, says thank you for your service. Oh, I want to say thank you for your service. And thank you so much, Aaron Lipsky, Chief Fire Department, for joining us. And we hope you can come back, like maybe once that top secret devices in use. I would absolutely love to. But you might you might find some way more interesting people to talk on your show also. Absolutely not. No. You're my new favorite. And I say new because I do rotate through them a bit, but you I at this moment I understand. You are it. You're my favorite interviewer. There we go. Perfect. Right, right now. <laughs> at this moment. Today. Yeah. <laughs> and Joey, it's not gonna get better than this. Take us out. But stay tuned, everyone. We're far from done. <laughs>